It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the first ASEAN Student Mobility Forum, a momentous two-day event that brings together academic officials, mobility officers, students, government officials in charge of higher education, and other stakeholders in an effort to examine the current state of and determine ways forward for mobility in the region. On behalf of the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to, to welcome uh, all of you to the first ASEAN Student Mobility Forum here in Manila. And first thing I have to say that I really like the, the logo of the Student Mobility. ASEAN countries in much greater number than they do today. So I thank you for your attention. welcome you all on behalf of SHARE, the EU support to higher education in the ASEAN region, to this first ASEAN Student Mobility Forum. For me, Kate is the perfect example of ASEAN EU uh, international mobility, um, and I would like to give her the floor. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you. So if you are perceptive enough, you will understand that this means studying abroad will bring the first time we love forever. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us on this, our fourth Policy Dialogue 11 webinar series. Uh, we're really pleased uh, that you can join us today. And we have uh, a diverse panel from Asia and Europe and many attendees as well from Asia and Europe. My name is Darren McDermott and I'm the team leader designate of the SHARE program. And I'd just like to give you a, an introduction to uh, the, the SHARE program, which has been running for the last five years. So SHARE is the EU's flagship higher education cooperation program with ASEAN. SHARE's overarching objective is to strengthen regional cooperation and enhance the quality, competitiveness and internationalization of ASEAN higher education, contributing to an ASEAN higher education space. Next slide, please. Uh, it's delivered uh, by a consortium comprised of the British Council, the German Academic Exchange Organization, the DAA Day, the Netherlands International Education Agency, NUFIC, and the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education, ENQA. And SHARE's approach to supporting regional higher education is inclusive. The program engages with ASEAN and relevant non-ASEAN entities to build on existing initiatives to serve as a platform for SOMED and the ASEAN Secretariat to engage with the, the higher education sector. So I'm really pleased uh, that we can discuss the topic of virtual mobility and collaborative online international learning. And I'd like to, uh, I suppose, reflect on that uh, just a, a little bit uh, and taking from a, an article uh, in the most recent forum magazine uh, by the European Association for International Education. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our moderator uh, for the session today. But before that, I'd just like to um, give you an update or uh, 
an, an intro into uh, the reason behind uh, this policy dialogue series. Uh, the next slide. So we really need to look at uh, how we ensure uh, the scalability of shares activities uh, and then ensure that they are sustainable uh, until uh, and beyond uh, the, the share program. Of course, we've all been struck by the challenge of, of COVID-19 uh, and we need to formulate effective strategies to deal with that and move forward uh, and look at uh, future risk and mitigation strategies for uh, the share extension. There's been significant uh, developments and innovations in the higher education space over the, the last number of years. Uh, and we are looking at these concertedly with SHARE and you'll hear more about these uh, in our session later. Uh, we'd also like to look at the, the long-term uh, perspectives for the development of an ASEAN higher education space. So, as I've mentioned, we have a, an excellent panel today looking at virtual mobility and collaborative online international learning. And our moderator for the session is Mr. Piet van Hove. Piet van Hove is the director of the International Relations Officer of the, the University of Antwerp, Belgium. He's been active in internationalization in the internationalization of higher education since 1995. And today he manages a team of 18 staff members working on student and staff mobility north-south cooperation and capacity building, international educational projects and the strategic, strategic networking. Pete has been active in the leadership of several professional organizations and nonprofits at national and international level for many years, such as the Flanders Knowledge Area, the Academic Cooperation Association, the ACA, and the NGO APOPO, which, um, if I'm not mistaken, Pete, trains uh, rats to save lives and, and detect uh, threats. So uh, very interesting NGO. Uh, Pete is also uh, very recently the vice president elect of the European Association for International Education 2020 to 2022. And at that point, I think I'd like to just introduce uh, the EAIE Forum magazine, and an article that Pete wrote on virtual mobility and collaborative online international learning uh, in its most recent uh, issue. Pete said, if traditional mobility has been the linchpin of internationalization in the analog past, then virtual mobility may steal center stage in the digital future. Developments such as the recent COVID-19 outbreak highlight the need for alternative means of facilitating meaningful online interactions across cultures and classrooms. And collaborative online international learning, or COIL, offers a systematic, systematic approach to doing exactly that. So really looking forward to hearing a lot more about this today. And I'd like to hand over to you, Pete. Thank you very much. <clears throat> OK. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much for the, the kind introduction and for the opportunity to, to be with you and all our participants today. Um, yes, we are in a new new context where online learning is suddenly the norm for all of us in higher education worldwide. And surely we will learn a lot from this. And, and I think we will we will go to a future where online will keep much more importance, uh, probably uh, in combination with uh, with face to face and, and having an optimal blend uh, of online and face to face learning is our future, I think. At the same time, right now, our uh, international mobility is halted and is unsure for the uh, for the midterm even, which is very problematic, of course, for us in, in international education. Uh, at the same time, the goals that we want to achieve with, with internationalization are more important than ever uh, in, in this uh, crisis-ridden world. Um, international and intercultural competences are, are more important than ever. Global citizenship, problem solving, solidarity between people from different countries, uh, cross-cultural teamwork, all of these uh, skills are more important than ever and depend on us in internationalization to to bring them into the curricula. So um, internationalization, of course, isn't and has never been uh, a synonym of mobility. Um, the good news is that as we face this challenge of how can we uh, engage internationally in an online, uh, uh, largely online environment. The good news is that there is a lot of experience out there uh, that we can use. And we have several panel members today who are very experienced in this area. So I think it will be a, a very interesting uh, session for, for all of us. Um, 
I want to just throw out a few uh, bits of terminology, even though I don't think it's it's uh, the most important thing. But still, uh, when we talk about virtual mobility and virtual exchange as as two central concepts, um, I would the distinction that's that's often made right now between those two is that virtual mobility. Uh, involves uh, transfer of credits. So a student taking a course at another university and getting credits for it. Um, that's And that course, since it's virtual mobility, will be taken online. That's that's the, the meaning usually given to, to the term virtual mobility, which I think if we refer back to our goals, international intercultural competence and these other transferable skills, I think virtual mobility in this definition is a very limited and not very interesting modality of of internationalization virtual exchange on the other hand is a by definition collaborative exercise which i like uh, much more both of the terms have in common that they they include the, the word virtual which i don't like because it seems to indicate uh, that the activities are not real uh, and we will get back to that probably uh, in the discussion and it's not very useful to refer to an activity by saying what it is not so uh, but i'm sure after today's session everyone will have much better idea of what is possible and what are the real uh, useful activities that we can develop. Um, we will listen to different experiences with online learning and the link uh, between online learning and internationalization. And we will um, understand better after uh, these, uh, these uh, different presentations, how we can develop um, virtual exchange as a very useful uh, tool in our uh, toolkit for internationalization at home and internationalization of the curriculum in an online uh, environment. Um, that said, um, I think we should uh, go to the presentations. We will have four presentations uh, by experts from the field. Um, and then we will have uh, a reaction uh, from uh, our panelist, Adrian Veal from the European Commission. Um, I suggest that uh, we have only very short time for questions after each uh, presentation, just uh, only limited to technical or very uh, specific uh, things that may be unclear in the presentations, but we keep the general questions and discussion uh, for the time after uh, the, the five uh, presentations. Um, that said, I would like to now uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmad uh, Latif uh, from um, uh, Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Latif uh, is a professor, associate professor at the uh, Kebangsan Malaysia University. Welcome, uh, Latif. Uh, he is currently the director at the University of the International Relations Center, UKM Global, and a senior lecturer in uh, the Center for Research in Media and Communication. Uh, he obtained his uh, bachelor degree in politics and international relations from the University of Kent uh, in England and a master's in mass communications uh, from the University Technology uh, Mara in Shah Alam uh, in uh, Malaysia. Um, and his PhD uh, from the University of Queensland, Australia, and his research focuses on intercultural communication and internationalization, which is right at the center, I think, of uh, the topics we want to discuss today. So you're very welcome, Dr. Latif, and I will give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, can you hear me clearly? So, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope the um, audio is good here right now. Thank you. If we could go to the front page. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and also a very, very good morning to our friends in Europe. Uh, today's topic is on virtual mobility and collaborative online international um, learning for ASEAN. And we are looking at the UKM experience in dealing with this situation. If we could go to the first slide, if possible. All right, now, um, defining virtual mobility is an interesting aspect. Virtual mobility basically became our buzzword, especially since COVID-19 happened and a lot of things have changed. So defining it comes into a very um, 
technical yet complex matter. So virtual mobility in higher education is known by the use of communication and information technologies to reach the same purpose as with physical mobility, but without the necessary, um, the ne the necessary and necessity for travel. Now, if you could look at defining virtual uh, mobility, it takes into account so many different aspects. It could be a form of semester exchange. And at the same time, it could also be in the form of a summer program, or it could be in the form of COIL, where there's some collaborative learning. So in our experience, we're going to be sharing about what happens with our virtual mobility program uh, for our exchange students that come from different parts of the world. If you could go to the next slide, please. Now, uh, there's some strong focus on why virtual mobility is important, and it is a desire to focus on the majority of students who are not mobile, and also trying to focus on internationalization at home. Yeah? And it is important for us to introduce the international dimension of teaching and learning to a group of students who are unable to go mobile. Now, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting. Whenever we talk about virtual um, mobility, it's always been a challenge and people are always saying, will this take place well? Uh, what are the challenges? Are the academics ready for this? You know, And would the students be able to accept it? Now, if we're talking about university and especially for undergraduate students, we're really focusing on the Gen Z. And here's some stereotypes of the Gen Z. They are all digital natives. They're very, very IT friendly. They're open to new ideas. For them, tradition may not be as exciting. They're a fast learner. Uh, they're also not earning as much income to travel just yet until, unless their parents could support them. Uh, they're also social media enthusiasts and they're living the virtual life. For example, um, eSports became very popular and no one would have thought that that would happen, uh, that someone could just sit down in front of their computer and get all excited communicating with game players from different parts of the world. So this is what virtual mobility is. Virtual mobility is about using technology for this generation and allowing them to experience teaching and learning from different parts of the world and see how people gather those information. Now, at times when we say, will this work? Well, you know what? With Gen Z and the stereotypes that I've mentioned, they are pretty receptive towards virtual uh, experience and virtual mobility. Yeah. Okay, for the next slide, please. Yeah, if you could go to the next slide, yeah. So I would like to share what happened with us with COVID-19 and the UKM experience. Um, with the movement control order, it actually restricts travel. So what happens during this period of time, which started on the 18th of March, our partner universities start recalling their students. Not all of them, but a majority of them did call back the students. And all physical mobility programs in Malaysia are tentatively not allowed until the 31st of December 2020. So basically what we have was that we wanted to ensure that the students still get their credits and we also wanted to ensure that they're, uh, they're not losing out at the same time. So what happened is that virtual was the only option that we have. So we had various students coming from the AUN platform coming from AIMS platform and various partner reciprocal arrangement that we have within through MOU. And what we had to do was actually come up with a virtual plan to our education. We, uh, during the movement control order, the university uh, basically went on a break for six weeks. And this six weeks allowed the academics to prepare content on the virtual mode. And then when class resumes again on six weeks, uh, there were a lot more uh, virtual content provided for the students. Okay, if you could go to the next slide. Now, the planning and, and, and strategies were very important. Yeah? We needed to identify the courses. What courses is suitable to go on virtual mobility? Now, not all courses are specifically um, applicable. For example, there are some challenges with um, courses that require some hands-on um, uh, applications. Uh, but of course, with technologies that today, that could also have been taken place. Uh, there's, there could be a problem in terms of, um, for example, lab work and some studio-related work that requires students to be in campus. We also need to identify academics and trainers who are excited, passionate, and able to understand this new technology that we have. I think a lot of lecturers need support in transferring information 
from the real world to the virtual world. There's a need to train academics to familiarize themselves with all the various technologies that exist and for them to be more at home when using the virtual realm. Yeah? Uh, we also need to develop a thorough course outline identifying the platforms that would be used and also detailing, for example, appointment dates, meeting dates, and classroom dates. Yeah? So we've got to clearly detail out the mode of delivery if we're using Zoom for synchronous or if you're required to do videos and that requires them to post onto YouTube. Those are things that need to be highlighted as well. We also have to consider all possible options of virtual delivery. Please understand that what we necessarily like or practice may not be the easiest way or the most feasible to our students. Some of these platforms or application takes up more data plans for students. And students um, are quite restricted in terms of the technology that they've been provided with and also the access to, um, to, the, to the technology that they have. For example, what we have in Malaysia, in UKM, we had a sponsor uh, who came in and actually well, an industry player who came in and provided uh, free internet for our students as well. We also need to understand international student base, where they are going to be. So if students are from ASEAN countries, it doesn't um, carry a lot of difference in terms of time zones, but actually there are challenges as well if your students are based in Europe and you're handling the classes in Malaysia, for example. Also try to understand the language barriers that may exist with the students. And uh, there's also a need to have support to academics and students. We in UKM actually have a support system or a telecounseling service for students who are overwhelmed with the new virtual mobility. We are there to guide them. And it's also to academics to ask for support and to go for counseling or need assistance in terms of how to use this new technology. And it's always good to get feedback from our students in terms of how they're feeling uh, that the virtual mobility class is going on as. All right, um, next please. So these are the various online platforms that we use. We use Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meetup, WebEx, or a, a synchronous one would be UKM Folio, which is our own learning management system for the country, uh, for, the, for the university, basically. So the students are exposed to all these various mediums, but it's also important to familiarize your academics, your professor, to these technologies as well. Students being digital um, natives, they are experts in all this medium, you know, they can use it just easily. But I believe that academics also need the support in terms of using this, yeah? All right, next, please. Uh, these are some of the programs. I apologize that a lot of them are in the national language here, but these are some of the support that we offer our um, academics and our professors in coming up with virtual mobility courses, yeah? uh, online courses as well. So they are expected to um, attend these webinars or these courses and these classes for them to understand the usage of the technology. Next, please. All right, now for academics, I think it's important to understand that virtual mobility is not just about taking all the physical class content and transferring it online. Now it's a whole different realm and you need to be very creative and explore what the younger generation want. It's not about transferring a three-hour lecture onto YouTube and students listening to it. You know, you've got to have links. You've got to associate it to YouTubes, for example. It's a whole different environment. It, it, it would be a failure if we just record our class and that's it. There's other elements to virtual um, mobility that we can enhance further. Now, for our students, uh, next slide, please. Yep, for our students, they need to find out how the program is being delivered, and they also need to be ensured that they have access to internet and technology required. They also need to be able to ask as many questions as possible and see how this will affect them as students. You know, There are some challenges in terms of handling this virtual mobility program, such as if there's some assignments or there's some group activities that they have to do, and especially issues relating to time zone if it involves other parts of the world. But students need to be proactive. It's no longer just about coming to classes, but it's ensuring that your schedule is up to date and that you are very, very, you understand how the virtual mobility is being run. Okay, uh, next example, please. 
So this is an example of our mobility session, you know, where um, this is my class where we have mobility students from Indonesia came in. And also we had our students from Melbourne uh, one of my ex-students and Afghanistan students who's studying in Melbourne now shares their experience to my um, my uh, master's uh, mobility students and also my local students. So they had so much fun because of the interactiveness that exists across the globe. All right, uh, next video, please. Uh, next PowerPoint. Yeah. So this one is an example uh, where we usually organize um, virtual. Uh, we organize a student mobility farewell program for students. So we just wanted to show you how in the picture on the left, you will see how we do it normally for our student mobility farewell, but uh, with a Christmas celebration. But this year, the virtual mobility farewell was done through Zoom. And we had our students even in the US coming in 12 hours behind us and also participating in the event. And our students from Kazakhstan, Malaysia, Indonesia, and also ASEAN countries. Uh, this is some of the experience that they've shared how their program had to be transformed to a virtual mobility program from the physical mobility. Uh, next slide, please. So where UKM is looking at is that we need to get feedback from the international students participating in this virtual mobility. Um, we need to get their information and how they feel about the whole program and how it has affected them and whether they find it effective. We're looking at training for more academics um, to be more ready uh, with this new uh, way of doing things. We're exploring COIL at the moment. We are planning for participation with our Japanese partner under the University of Mobility of Asia Pacific program. There's a COIL program coming up and we look forward to that. We want to establish short-term summer programs through the virtual uh, mobility format and that may take some challenges as well, but we're trying to find some elements that could actually explain things, especially in terms of enhancing cross-cultural competence. And we hope that with more collaborative effort that would take place. We are developing programs with Australia, Mexico, and Indonesia. Uh, with Australia, we're hoping to come up with a business innovation challenge where industry players will also come in and students need to brainstorm and come up with some interesting business plan for them to do. And this will be done through the virtual realm and the incorporation of virtual and physical mobility for the future. So maybe they can spend less time here, but more effective spending of time. So basically, next slide, please. Basically, that's my very, very short, I hope I'm in time, 10 minutes presentation. And if there's any question, you can email me or we can go to the chat session after this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Latif. That was a, a very uh, interesting overview of where you stand in relation to, to virtual exchange and virtual mobility, and you introduced some of the, the key concepts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I didn't see any uh, very specific question pop up so far uh, in the chat about your presentation, so I, I think uh, we could move on. Uh, to the uh, next speaker and, and have the in-depth discussion, including with you, uh, immediately afterwards. Thank you very much. So our uh, next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Tui from uh, Vietnam National University in Hanoi. Um, welcome, uh, Professor Tui. Um, Professor Tai received a, a law degree and a PhD degree uh, from uh, Moldova National University uh, in Moldova. Uh, she is, has been a professor, an associate professor since 2009, um, working as a lecturer in finance and banking law uh, at the uh, School of Law at Vietnam National University. Uh, she uh, was appointed Director of Human Resource Development in 2014, and since 2015, she's the Deputy Director of the Academic Affairs Department at Vietnam uh, National University in Hanoi. Um, Dr. Toy has uh, published many books, articles, research projects, uh, on higher education and finance, banking, law, and business law. Welcome, uh, Professor Tai, and uh, please, uh, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much for introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, share with you our experience uh, from Vietnam National University Hanoi uh, on uh, um, online training. <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, so please, uh, next slide. Next slide, so please. 
Yes, yeah. Um, our, um, the title of the presentation is uh, Virtual Training uh, Lessons from VNU and uh, Prospects for Shares Collaborative Online International Learning uh, Co. And our presentation uh, uh, is uh, divided into uh, four parts. As the first part, I uh, would like to introduce to you a little bit about our university. And the second part is the uh, uh, our experience in online training during COVID-19 pandemic. And the third one, uh, I would like to share with you evolutions of online training during COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the last one uh, is the prospect for future cooperation with shared partner universities. So please go to the next slide. And um, I think uh, maybe uh, you know about uh, our university. Um, our university is one of the two leading uh, multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral uh, national university in Vietnam, uh, tasked with uh, producing highly qualified human resources for the development of the country. And we have uh, totally 34 uh, members under our university. And uh, in uh, 2012 and 20, According to the QS World University Rankings, uh, Vietnam National University Hanoi first ranked first in Vietnam and uh, 147 in Asia, and uh, uh, VNU is the uh, is the one of uh, is one in the group of uh, uh, 801 uh, and to uh, 1000 in the World uh, University Rankings, uh, the best university in the world. And so, please, the uh, next slide. And uh, now we have uh, four campuses uh, uh, in Vietnam, and the biggest uh, campus is uh, the biggest uh, campus uh, is located on uh, Hoa Lạc. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, I'd like to share with you Hoa Lạc campus. Yeah, this is the big, the largest uh, campus in uh, uh, in uh, is located in uh, Hoa Lạc Hoa Lạc urban and uh, um, and. Uh, after 2030, uh, we will move to this place. Yeah, on our university. Next slide, please. And about um, number of uh, incoming international students, inbound students. Um, in uh, 2019, we have uh, totally uh, we have totally uh, 852 852 students, international students. Uh, come to Vietnam National University Hanoi uh, to take part in uh, short-term, uh, long-term, and exchange programs. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, uh, a big number uh, compared to um, compared to the number of students in uh, in, uh, in, 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 in in the year in, uh, in the year in, in um, 2018. And 18. Next slide, please. And uh, about online training experience, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, um, the first one. Uh, our training, uh, our online training uh, is based on uh, legal documents um, issued by uh, Ministry of uh, Education and Training. Um, for example, circular number 12, uh, official correspondent number 78795, uh, and uh, official correspondent number 988. And, uh, and these documents uh, allows, allow uh, our units uh, to, um, uh, to, to, take, to take online training, online training, and uh, we uh, have a responsibility for our, our online training. Yeah, and based on these documents, uh, we have uh, three uh, directive documents. The National University issues three directive documents. Uh, the first one, uh, official correspondent number 730, 737, and uh, number two, um, number correspondent number 1207, and uh, the last one, uh, guidance number 1345. And um, uh, the last one uh, is the most um, important documents. Um, uh, which uh, is leading uh, our online training. And um, uh, based on these documents, units uh, 
our UNIS uh, must set out online training plan, policy, and uh, and uh, on outcome recognition, IT in infrastructure, quality assurance, teaching content, teaching and learning activities, and examination and assessment. And uh, so, please next slide. Yeah, and uh, according to this uh, documents, um, if uh, our uh, our unit uh, training units uh, want to um, want to take want, want to carry out carry out uh, the online training, they have to um, they have to meet um, the following requirements. Uh, the first one, a digital quarter assessment on the internet, and uh, the second, service and computer system. Uh, available and uh, learning management uh, system, learning content management system, digital learning materials uh, are available. Yeah, and uh, um, human resources uh, are capable of uh, operating um, uh, online system. And uh, the last one uh, is regulation on application of uh, of a technology. IT, IT yeah. Um, and um, do you know uh, the online training, uh, the online training management and uh, um, operation? Um, in fact, uh, Binu has uh, guidelines, and uh, Binu has a center for center for center for the education quality assurance. Yeah, and uh, uh, this center. Uh, this center uh, uh, has uh, has a responsibility to give advice, train, and assist lectures. Lecturers in uh, is using application tools and software uh, to build lesson content, uh, lecturing and uh, deploying online teaching. Yeah, and uh, based on uh, the guidance of uh, VNU, training units uh, set out detailed plans on uh, online training. And uh, you can see the content of uh, the plan of uh, each unit. So please, uh, next next slide. Yeah, uh, plan of the on online training um, has um, some content. For example, method and volume of a uh, training program to organize online training, uh, not exceeding uh, twenty uh, credits of uh, the um, program each program. Timetable of teaching software that allows students to register course and uh, to teach uh, and to, to learn to learn uh, lessons. Yeah, monitoring request teachers to record the lesson procedure, register email address, and uh, ensure necessary technical and technical support requirements. And the plan has um, um, has to uh, show on digital learning materials to meet the needs of learners. Yeah, and uh, in the plan, um, each uh, training unit has to uh, has to uh, show the um, uh, updating electronic lectures and uh, at least uh, once a year, and uh, online system for security checkups and regular updates to match the needs of users. Yeah, that is uh, the content of the plan of online training made by uh, each uh, training unit of your university. Yeah, so uh, please next slide. And I would like to share uh, this is the case of uh, our University of Engineering and Technology, uh, UET. Yeah, and uh, in this university, um, the, lect the lecture, the lecture, visual lecture for a lesson of uh, at least uh, 25 minutes. Yeah, and uh, besides that, the uh, lecturers can uh, discuss with the students. Uh, and can show uh, students uh, video clip and uh, um, maybe and, uh, and and some uh, uh, experiments. Yeah, the results of the experiments uh, made by them made by themselves. Yeah, and uh, in this university, uh, there are two uh, modes. Two modes. Uh, one of these real time synchronous, and the other one is uh, asynchronous. Yeah. And the, the first one, uh, the first one was lecturers and students attend online classroom. Yeah, and the second one, 
um, students watch only watch video lecture and um, they have to do the given task assignments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So please, uh, the next slide. Yeah. Uh, pre and um, in online training experience, um, our university uh, require um, our training units uh, to follow to uh, quality assurance principles. Principles. Uh, the first principles uh, is about is about the content of the module and uh, the content of the module must meet the standards for learning outcomes of the module and uh, curriculum yeah and uh, this module and curriculum uh, are approved by the department and our faculty before teaching before teaching by uh, lecturers by lecturers and uh, the second uh, principle is the uh, about teaching and learning activities and uh, these uh, are designed to promote the skills, uh, different skills of students, and uh, this way to improve the learners, the uh, lifelong learning ability. Yeah. So we have uh, two principles pre uh, in online training, and uh, about tools for online training. Yeah, uh, I think uh, every user uh, can use. Uh, different applications, services, uh, for example, uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Google Classroom, and um, maybe each university can uh, can design uh, can design specific um, specific tools for their uh, online training. Um, for example, um, applications uh, like uh, learning management system. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, uh, online training uh, experience at VNU. So uh, uh, our guidance uh, states that uh, the lecturer has uh, some responsibilities. Uh, for example, prepare and deliver online lessons. Yeah, this is a very uh, important responsibility uh, for our lecturers. Okay, uh, Dr. Tui, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you just a second. Uh, in the interest of, of uh, time and, and sticking to our program, uh, I could kindly ask you to uh, maybe um, uh, last, move forward yeah. uh, to the, 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 the last part of your presentation. I okay, think the, okay. the last two slides uh, you had were very relevant for the discussion that will follow. So if I could okay. suggest that. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So please, yeah. Uh, so um, I'd like to share with you uh, some uh, um, feedback from uh, online training uh, online training in uh, Binenu. Uh, I think that uh, um, uh, online training uh, in our university has uh, some advantages. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, first one, most units uh, follow the study plan set uh, out by Binenu. This is very important. And uh, the second one, uh, modules are taught in accordance with course outlines. Uh, outline tests and assessment are recognized uh, as components. Yeah. And uh, the third one, students are allowed to register for the minimum number of credits uh, of the semester as rooms by VNU, uh, minimum 14 uh, credits. Yeah. And uh, study continuously during the COVID 19 social distan uh, distancing. Yeah, and uh, the next, um, most unit have carried out online training, uh, ensuring the training plan for the semester is very important. Yeah, and the last one, some units have uh, upgraded their computer uh, labs at the school infrastructure ready for online training activities. Yeah, besides that, uh, there are some disadvantages. Uh, um, uh, first one, uh, our uh, learning management system and learning content management system uh, are remain, remain under development. Yeah, and uh, online those online trainings uh, by Vindu units have not been uh, standardized. And uh, the, the second facilities of the training units are different. Uh, some schools cannot implement online uh, training. 
yeah, you know, we have uh, 34 units under our university and uh, the facilities of this um, units are very different. Yeah. And uh, the third one, some students have difficulties in online learning, such as lack of uh, uh, skill in using of software to study. It is uh, sometimes a little, a little bit difficult. Yeah, and uh, allowing computers um, uh, unstable, uh, internet connection, and etc. Um, and uh, the next uh, disadvantage is uh, difficulties in uh, monitoring students in class activities and uh, cheating during maybe uh, yeah, during test, for example, copy or in uh, personal action. And the last one, uh, just a pages, is the uh, technical problems. Yeah. Uh, for example, internet connection issue, connection issues, software errors, and difficulties in opening and arranging uh, many online classes at the same time. Yeah. And um, next slide, please. Uh, and um, I'd like to uh, post some solutions to develop online training. Yeah, so first one, uh, design uh, LMS and uh, SCMS system. And the second, uh, design online examination, including multiple choice and essays for students to show their skills and knowledge uh, clearly and avoid cheating. Yeah, the third one, organize instructional section, set up the law groups or to share teaching learning experience for teachers and students. Um, and the fourth, lecturers and lecturers, the must be <clears throat> such an, such, such an sufficiently provided to students before lesson. This is important, yeah. And uh, preparedness for technical issues such as language overload or emergency technical support. Yeah, and um, solutions for cooperation development. Yeah, so next slide, please. Yeah, prospects for future cooperation. I'd like to say that uh, VNU is willing to cooperate with partner universities in the uh, yeah. And uh, some of our universities, some of our schools have IT system, very modern IT system, and necessary utilization capable of uh, conducting online training. And uh, we have a, a modern library system with a diversity of written documents to be utilized in online training and ready for um, uh, code. Next, please. And the last, yeah. And solution, uh, I think so. Uh, uh, first one, you know, we have to share, have to uh, set up common regulations on online training, uh, standardized online training system. For example, uh, in this, um, uh, in this uh, document, uh, um, we have to propose uh, some requirements on software, course, outlines, lec lectures, activities, examinations, assessments, and evaluation, uh, credit recognition, IT administration, etc. And uh, the second one, uh, share has to establish the specific requirements for exchange students uh, when uh, learning online. For example, language requirements, uh, learning skills, skills, for example, uh, communication skills, group working skills, presentation skills, yeah, the third one is um, SHARE has to organize online courses in addition to the Asian uh, schools courses by uh, fields of uh, training for students to join and obtain credit. Yeah, and uh, continue, of course, uh, SHARE continues to organize conferences seminars on uh, different topics relating to internet internetizations in um, higher education and um, provide financial support for co and strengthen uh, promotional activities and communication about co. Yeah, I think um, there is uh, some solutions for uh, cooperation in the future. Thank you very much for attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tui, for this overview of where you stand in uh, tran the transfer to online learning and what possibilities you see for the future. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will move on uh, to the next presenter, uh, who is uh, my colleague Simone Hackett from the Netherlands. She is at the Hague University of Applied Sciences, where she works as a senior lecturer, researcher, and head of internationalization at the Faculty of Health and Sports. She has over 13 years uh, of experience in internationalization and virtual exchange. 
Uh, she is um, a member of the leadership of the EAIE um, and has uh, been working in recent years to expand uh, COIL uh, throughout uh, the institutions uh, where she has worked, previously Utrecht University of Applied Sciences and now uh, the Hague University of Applied Sciences. So welcome, uh, Simone, and thank you for taking the time to share your uh, views on the topic and uh, please uh, uh, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Simone, you are muted, I'm afraid, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Better. So good afternoon. Thank you, Pete, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to everybody who has tuned in to us. Um, so I'm going to discuss Virtual Exchange Collaborative Online International Learning COIL in the Netherlands and Europe as well. Um, so first of all, I want to start with um, the term virtual exchange. And I, I'm interested in definitions for two reasons. One, because I'm doing research into whether um, COIL is effective or not in helping students develop intercultural competence. And the other reason is because um, the term virtual exchange is very broad and includes many different initiatives. And these, sometimes this, people can get confused with um, um, uh, what, what virtual exchange actually means. So for me, I, I think it's important to define the differences, the different initiatives that fall under virtual Virtual exchange. So if we look at virtual exchange, the, the term, um, it's an umbrella term used to describe technology-enabled sustained people-to-people -people educational programs um, in which the same communication and interaction takes place between individuals or groups who are geographically separated. This can include um, initiatives such as virtual mo mobility, which um, Dr. Latif and um, Dr. Latoy already mentioned. And this is what, what, we're, what, what we're actually all rushing to do right now because of the COVID and mobility restrictions, is that when our programs go online, our students can participate in these uh, uh, online courses abroad and, and obtain credits for these uh, courses. And it can include um, students also developing intercultural competencies from this um, uh, experience, but it might not necessarily include that. Um, the next, um, and of course, there are many other uh, initiatives and terms as well, but these are just a select few that I have chosen uh, for this presentation. The next one is telecollaboration, and this is um, um, uh, where you will have two lecturers, two language proficiency lecturers who are either teaching Spanish or, or Dutch or English, who will connect and help each help uh, uh, design a course in which their students will be able to practice their English or their Spanish with students abroad online. Um, so that is what telecollaboration calls, and it's also called online intercultural exchange as well. Then you have collaborative online international learning, which is very similar to uh, telecollaboration, except that it's cross-discipline. And uh, you will have two lecturers designing a course or an assignment together. They will connect through their exchange partnerships or their networks. They will develop this assignment, this course uh, together. The students will participate in this course or assignment online for a specific amount of time. And through this experience, they will develop skills, uh, intercultural competencies, as well as skills in their specific subjects. Perhaps it's health, engineering, um, um, uh, teacher training, etc. Then you also have online intercultural dialogue. And this is a pre-made course, I suppose, online course, uh, which uh, organizations such as Sharing Perspective or, or Erasmus Plus have designed. And it doesn't involve two lecturers designing a course together or an assignment together. It's already pre-made and students can enroll in this course. And in this course, they will be able to participate in dialogues, discussions, conversations with other students abroad online on various topics. Uh, and the end goal, of course, is to improve or, or develop, further develop their intercultural communication skills and their cultural knowledge as well. Um, Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange um, is, is a combination of uh, COIL and online intercultural dialogue. So Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, the EVE program, has set up trainings for online intercultural dialogue and, and training for COIL-typed courses um, for uh, lecturers who are interested in developing these courses. And they will also help you find a partner to develop these uh, COIL assignments or, or, or courses with. Um, and I will give you the, the links to uh, Erasmus Virtual Exchange as well in this presentation. 
So I'm going to focus on collaborative online international learning because that's my expertise. That's what I've been uh, developing over the years and teaching as well and what I'm researching at the moment. So let's, why are we doing it? So in the Netherlands, only 22% of Dutch students go abroad. So what about the remaining 78%? Do they get an international experience? We want to make sure that they do. So there is a need to internationalize, internationalize at home instead of sending these students abroad to uh, develop and uh, obtain intercultural competence. Um, we also have to consider future challenges and developments such as social, economic, health and environmental um, challenges, issues, uh, developments. Um, so um, as educators, it's our responsibility to prepare our students for these challenges. In addition to this, we have mobility restrictions, such as looking at the uh, at global warming. According to Robin Shields' paper, 2019, um, the, the total emissions from uh, student mobility is equivalent to the total emissions from a whole country such as Tunisia or, or Croatia. So given this, we're, it's not unlikely that in the future there will be more um, uh, emphasis put on uh, or restrictions put, put on travel and car, perhaps even carbon taxes introduced on travel, which will make it more expensive to go abroad. So students, more students might not uh, choose to go abroad and universities also will, will take the social responsibility in not sending their students abroad. And of course, viruses such as COVID, which has put a stop on uh, mobility for the uh, foreseeable future. Um, our responsibility to help our students develop skills to help to to um, adapt in these situations, and this is why we are um, introducing COIL and virtual exchange initiatives. Um, it's relatively affordable to implement, so it doesn't involve um, uh, sending your lecturers abroad or sending your students abroad, although that's not to say that it doesn't uh, take time to develop a course like this. Of course it does, it's much more um, time Um, you have to develop it together, you have to rely on your partner, build up a relationship with your partner, and this all takes time. So it, it, it's affordable in, 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 in perhaps cost, thinking about flights or travel, but it's, um, in time it can be expensive because it is going to take more time to develop it. Um, partnering is an advantage for um, our exchange partners or our research partners because it can strengthen an, ex uh, an existing partnership um, that perhaps there's, there's nothing happening with that partnership at the moment. There's no students traveling there. There's no research being done with this partner. And this COIL will give it a boost by bonding the two universities together. What's in it for the academics? Um, broadening of teaching and learning skills, understanding uh, and knowledge, joint international research projects. So for example, I'm um, d doing a joint research paper with my COIL partner in New York now, which we hope to get published. So this is an example of how wh what's in it for me. Why, why would I do this as well? Um, so if we look at what it actually is, so it's a teaching and learning tool that helps students and educators develop intercultural competence amongst other skills as well across shared multicultural online learning environments. It's internationalization at home as opposed to internationalization abro abroad. It's a shared syllabus teaching approach. Um, as I said, that you have to have a partner to develop the assignment, to develop the course with. So you can, you, you will find this partner through your networks, through your uh, international office. If you contact your international office, they will give you a list of your of the of the international partners you have abroad you can contact these to ask uh, whether there are whether they are developing coil courses or you can find it through perhaps a conference in your discipline um, another lecturer who would be interested in developing uh, a coil course um, uh, it adds an international dimension to regular face-to-face -face classes in the blended format and that was in the past but now for, for example for me all my courses are going to be online next semester so it's completely online there there is no blended format all, all, at the moment um, uh, until probably January or so. But in the past, we did it in the bland, blended format. If you'd have a regular face-to-face -face class, you could add this international dimension to it um, uh, online. Um, yes. So COIL falls under the social constructivist educational uh, approach of collaborative online learning or collaborative learning, which is quite important. So um, it's not just about um, giving uh, students an assignment and they will they will just learn by completing the assignment the learning happens 
um, through the interaction, through, through the social interaction with their peers uh, within their class and also with the peers online and their teacher as well. And through this learning, um, uh, through this collaboration, this is where they learn. They learn, for, they, they acquire knowledge and they acquire new knowledge and it evolves over time. So this is very important that we, that we put the emphasis on the collaboration between students um, within COIL. Um, it's very popular within the Netherlands. Uh, Utrecht University started with in 2012 and Amsterdam University of Applied started in 2013 and other universities followed like the Hague University where I'm working, Maastricht University and other University of Applied Sciences and Research Universities within the Netherlands. This gave rise to the first European COIL conference which was held in 2016 at the Hague University of Applied Sciences and now um, with COVID, uh, with this pandemic, there's also a surge of interest in uh, developing COIL courses uh, within universities as well as in the Netherlands and within Europe. Um, and there is some confusion, though, because, of course, I've been working with COIL a long time. I had a lot of um, uh, people come to me immediately saying, oh, well, now we can't travel. Now our students can't develop intercultural competence. You know, you know what COIL is, so can you help us with this? And we have to say, okay, COIL is, is not virtual mobility. What they were looking for was virtual mobility. So these students who were supposed to have gone abroad this semester can who cannot need to fill that gap now and what they could have what they are doing as well is have these students follow courses online to retrieve credits but COIL is much more um, complex than that because it takes time it takes time to find a partner to uh, develop to build up a relationship with that partner to develop an assignment together and it's a longer process it, 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 it the end goal is to help your students develop intercultural competencies as well as other skills but it's much more um, uh, complex and just saying, okay, everything's online, go follow that course. Um, so that, that's a difference, uh, which is um, very important, which is something we really, really need to consider. This is just a model, the COIL model, which I have created to give a visualization of how it works. So what you can see is um, at the beginning, you have um, uh, two bachelor programs. So these could be in health, these could be in nursing, they could be in uh, business. Uh, one is based in the Netherlands and one is based in the USA. They are connected through their network, so exchange partners, research partners. Um, together, um, uh, lecturers from each one of these universities, either they find each other from central level or they find each other at a, at a conference, will connect and develop a course together online. Um, within this course, there will be assignments. They will divide their, um, their classes. So let's say you have 30 students in each class. They will divide their students into teams, three US students, three Dutch students. These students will work in teams for about four to 10 weeks. And during this process, they will uh, work on a, a product or solve a problem, which they need to submit at the end of it. And through this experience, they develop intercultural competence. Um, yeah, and that's basically what COIL entails. Um, an example at my university um, uh, is at the health faculty in nutrition and dietetics. Um, what we have set up is actually we have eight first year classes um, and each one of these classes and um, the students within each one of these classes receive a COIL experience in their first year. So we're talking about 270 students approximately. And um, we have um, uh, um, develop partnerships for each one of these um, groups. There are different partnerships in the UK, South Africa, the USA, and we team our students up with the with the students from the, our partner universities, and together they make an assignment on um, uh, dietary guidelines. So comparing dietary guidelines in the UK, comparing them to the Netherlands, comparing dietary uh, uh, guidelines in South Africa to the Netherlands. And through this experience, they de they develop the, the, their knowledge on dietary guidelines uh, from, from a Dutch perspective and also from the partner's perspective um, and also in, in develop their intercultural communication skills and, in, uh, skills and intercultural competencies. Um, uh, as you can see here, I'm not going to read through the whole thing because you can read it yourself as well. But um, it's, it's, what's quite unique about this is one is that we managed to ensure that all of our students in first year for this particular program have had a COIL experience. And in addition to that, it's part of the exam regulation. So this is really important because sometimes what happens f from my experience of working at two universities with COIL who have designed COIL assignments is that if it's not part of the exam regulations, the pine 
your near teacher who develops this assignment might do it for a couple of years, but then he or she might move on to something else. And when he or she does move on to something else, the COIL assignment is lost because the next teacher or lecturer does not continue it. But if we include it in the exam regulations, it means it has to, it, it's mandatory for it to continue. And the next teacher who te teaches this course will have to continue teaching this. So um, uh, this is why we, we have done this with this particular um, uh, program. And it's one of our ambitions within Den Haag to do this with other, with other courses as well. And the assignment is mandatory. If students do not participate in it, they cannot pass the course. They can't pass, they can't get their credits for this particular um, course. So that's it's very, very um, important. And these are just some examples of the assignments that they did in this course of comparing the UK to the Netherlands in terms of um, uh, yeah, nutritional assessment or um, intake and things like that. And, uh, and also the, the nutritional um, um, uh, plans such as the pyramid, the wheel, etc. Um, and an image of our students working with students in the UK as well. Uh, what I mean, I think, I think, I'm not sure if I'm over my 10 minutes, but I just want to make sure that I continue with this one. Um, with developing collaborative learning assignments, the collaborative learning is really, really important because that's where the learning, uh, through the collaboration, the learning, um, uh, uh, the collaboration is a part of the learning. Um, it involves a joint intellectual pursuit to complete a project or solve a problem, and it falls on the social constructive approach of Vygotsky's theory, knowledge is co-constructed, and that individuals learn from interaction. Um, it's really important that you make sure that your assignment is collaborative and that it's not just uh, one hour where uh, a group, two groups of students uh, talk to each other and who, boom, that's coiled, they have developed intercultural competencies. It's much more than that. They really need to mix with each other, they need to work together, they need to experience uh, differences, even conflict, and through that collaboration they learn. So uh, if you look at the important, under important COIL assignment must be collaborative, it must be complex, so that it's not just one of the team members can develop the assignment and uh, by themselves and the others can be idle. It has to be really complex so that they need each other, um, and that's the dependence part, they need each other to complete the assignment. It should involve groups of two or more students, um, so perhaps you could have one-on-one -on -one each side like a buddy system or teams of uh, of six three on the like for example my example three on the u.s side and three on the dutch side uh, communicating and working online um, either at the same time or in uh, different time zones i personally think that it's better when the classes are synced within uh, class time uh, and then it's really dedicated time where the students can communicate and work together and um, assess the project the assignment that you're going to um that they submit, but also the collaborative process as well, because as I said, that's the learning process and that's the really the important part. Of course, the product, the end goal is also important, but really the learning happens through the collaborative process. So I would try to assess that. A duration, a minimum of four to 10 weeks, um, I think is necessary um, to really experience, to have this international experience and develop these competencies. And the lecturers and students are both facilitating the learning process, so they're both very important in this um, uh, in this course or this assignment. Um, I want to move on to getting started and um, finding a partner because I saw some of the questions that came up in the in the live feed there. Someone's like, how can you how can you find a partner? Um, as I said before, you can find a partner by using your contacts, either if you go to conferences uh, as an academic, if you go to conferences, or if you're working, um, you have a whole list of exchange partners for research or different projects, contact these universities and see if they are interested in developing um, COIL assignments. And the SUNY COIL Global Network, so COIL started at State University in New York, that's what SUNY stands for, and they have a whole website, the, the, the SUNY COIL Center have a whole website with resources and information so you can go to this as well to find a partner as well they have a global network partnership with different universities who are involved in COIL. Erasmus and Virtual Exchange have a page dedicated the EVE project they have a, a page dedicated to trainings in COIL um, trainings in virtual exchange trainings in intercultural dialogue check it out they can also ha help you find a partner also another one uni collaboration which is um started with the telecollaboration um, method and has developed further across discipline, but they also have a lot of different um, resources and tools and contacts that you can um, check out. 
when seeking for when looking for a partner what 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 should you um uh what 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 are you looking for equal commitment so it's very important that both sides are committed to developing the assignment i had it before that i i started uh developing an assignment a coil assignment with a partner and at the beginning i could, it went well but then i could really feel that she was not committed to to developing this and i had to cut it immediately because i could not rely on you know developing going along and then when the students when they were supposed to start in september my partner is not there anymore. So you really need to develop this equal commitment and enthusiasm for developing a course together. Uh, shared course development, uh, differences in institution, culture, organization. Also, um, uh, you know, are, do you both have the same goal? Um, do you both want to achieve the same things? And it also goes for the curriculum as well. What, what are the end, what's the end goal? What are the learning outcomes? And keeping an open mind as well and, um, and, 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 and expecting the unexpected, I suppose. Um, for, um, when developing the course, uh, and this is my second last slide and then I'm finished. Um, so quick practical questions to ask a potential partner when developing this assignment. So how many students is it involved? How many groups, how many teams of students? This is important one to ask. How many credits are involved? Because what might happen is that maybe one course is only worth one credit and the other course is worth 10 credits. So the amount of effort the students might put into this assignment might be very different. So you need to get a balance so that they're putting the same amount of effort in, my experiences. How long will the course be? When will it start? When will it finish? Um, if it's 10 weeks or it's 20 weeks, are there any holidays in that in that time? We need to determine these things so that we're totally in sync. How and where would you be able to fit in a COIL project into the main program or course? Um, what are the learning outcomes of the course? Um, so apart from developing intercultural competencies, what other, what other um, learning outcomes are there? This depends on the discipline. What kind of collaborative assignments would students do together in your course? So if it's a period of 10, 10 weeks, they will have several collabor collabor collaborations during this period. So what, is, what are they going to entail? Will they be icebreakers? Will they be smaller assignments? Will they be the bigger assignments? Will they do them all together? Um, also time zones, okay? So this is good for if you want to sync your classes, make sure you have um, time zones that will work together. Um, how will students be assessed? And um, what tools are we going to use? Microsoft Teams, Blackboard Collaborative, Zoom, Canvas, Google, WhatsApp, Padlet, Moodle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So determine these things when you're when you're looking for a potential partner and when you want to develop an assignment together. Um, and networks and resources, these are just a few that I've just put here. So as I mentioned before, the SUNY COIL Center, there's the link there, Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, Uni Collaboration. This is a good one because it's coming up in September, the International virtual exchange conference isaac it was supposed to be held a physical conference because of covid they've moved it on online virtually completely so that's going to happen from september 14 to 16 and the registration has just opened so if you want to and limited spots so if you want to register that i do that as soon as possible and of course the european association for international education and um, they are always posting resources uh, literature and um, blogs, etc., on different um, educational approaches and methods. And one of these is also virtual exchange and COIL. So you can check that out as well. And that's it. I finished. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone, for uh, for outlining the concept of COIL uh, with us yeah. and bringing some practical examples and also showing the complexity of the. Uh, yeah. of uh, implementing coils so um, we see that uh, it's not as easy as just copy pasting uh, yeah. uh, online okay uh, i suggest we move on immediately to our uh, next speaker um, professor uh, ikeda keiko ikeda is from kansai uh, university in japan she is a professor in the division of international affairs and also the coil co coordinator for kansai university which is as far as i know a pioneering university in that respect in asia um, she's also now the vice director of the institute for innovative global education uh, at uh, kansai university and her interests are in internationalization at home and constructing active learning programs uh, collaborating with universities overseas. Uh, welcome, uh, Keiko, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. I hope everybody can see my slides. 
Um, I will try to be brief and concise, but I'd like to have a mini, um, to bring, bring you a mini food for thought. Um, all the panelists today have already brought a lot of information about COIL and then other virtual exchange and virtual, virtual mobility. So um, some might uh, resonate and I try to uh, try to be brief on that part and then I explore more of our students' perspectives and what's meant for them for my presentation. So I'll go ahead on that. All right. So um, just to get to the definition part just briefly, so online project-based practice is COFOIL, Collaborative Online International. Then it's also known as virtual exchange as well in a different regions. And, and I think definition differences has been already laid out. It's a pedagogy and how to have students engage in a learning with overseas institution and be it a class to class or be peers to peers with a carefully designed curriculum. He applies IT tools, of course, mostly the tools available on the web, to have students carry out a project-based task in a virtual team with the various backgrounds. COIL is a team teaching effort. A domestic and overseas courses are offered in a different institutions. It provides a project-based learning to the students in an international team setting. Because of the design of the practice, COIL enables teachers to bring collaborative learning to students. It also engages students more to the classroom learning. And from various cross-cultural encounters and communication that students will go through, it brings a high impact learning effect as a learning outcome, and that's what we want. As institutions seek to expand course offerings, there might be an increasing necessity to share courses through virtual exchange, alliances, um, and registries. In doing so, potentially a greater number of students will have access to intercultural classes offered by partner institutions around the world, thus re-emphasizing discipline-specific learning over destination-oriented traveling. Virtual exchange, uh, virtual mobility, telecollaborative language learning, and collaborative online project-based learning called COIL, Various virtual mode of learning that are uh, accessible to us and to the students at home ground now. Because it is to connect community to community, class to class, it's a highly engaging learning mode. Similar to Simone, she has mentioned it a little bit, but let me argue about the body of the choir from a different perspective environmental care. Study abroad almost always involves air traveling, obviously, arguably the most fuel intensive way to move around. For example, a, a round trip from New York to London, about 7,000 miles, produces something on the order of a three tons of CO2 per passenger. Collaborative and immersive learning brought by virtual exchange or COIL would enhance the learning effect. It contributes to change in understanding actions and the vision of their belief system while not creating more carbon footprints. Now with the inclusion of virtual practice in international education, this can go into two directions. A predominant physical mobility course supported by online mobility or a predominant online course supported by physical mobility. In this case, advantage of a short or long immersion are combined with an advantage of a flexible implementation of mobility, capturing both the benefits of physical and the virtual mobility. For students' perspectives, uh, and what we want to bring to students, virtual exchange and COIL or, and the virtual mobility also can bring ways to shore and create future-ready attributes for graduates at each institution. To be future ready in the time what we're living, and this means a lot more in depth now that we are going through the COVID time. One needs to have various skills in hand, perhaps more than what, what was expected when many of us actually are watching this uh, webinar, which is, were just about to graduate from college. Virtual exchange in core practice, because of its nature, it cultivates many of these dimensions at once, as shown in the slide. Through international collaboration, they develop intercultural competence, cultural awareness. They also develop various skills, such as planning a project, working team, and develop ways to think critically. ICTUs would 
train them to be digitally mature, of course, and they might be digital native already, as Latifus has said. But not only just savvy with the tech given to them, but now how to get around with technology when they're not so available. And the virtual teamwork. This is getting to be very important even more as we live in a digital, digitally connected lifestyle. It's more difficult, as we all experience, I'm sure, to build trust and manage accountability and form bonds among teams separate by the physical distance. Virtual teamwork has a great potential for miscommunication or misunderstanding. Some research says that the one in every four virtual teams is not fully functional. So the skill is becoming highly essential for their future successful employability. From a senior international officer perspective, which I am, virtual exchange coil has merits to adapt as well. One foremost would be that it enables institutions to establish a stronger university partnerships. Susan Sutton uh, has laid out nicely of types of unsuccessful university partnerships in overview, as you can see inside here. So one can be doormat, one's had activity but no longer, paper only, signed agreements, no activity, lopsided one way rather than two way, or standard transactional string exchanges, and that's the only thing that's happened. High performance international partnership can be generated by virtual exchange acquired practices promoted at the institutional level. File cabinets of dormant MOUs, I'm sure you have them, are being replaced with focused programs of partnership development by engaging in coil activity. Global learning, global awareness and a global perspective can be facilitated even when students remain in mass in their home country. What virtual exchange coil brings us is then we can call it say international educational high performance partnership. As enrollment patterns shift, such means of collaboration between institutions will likely become even more important and there may be also be acceleration of other forms of collaboration could happen, such as global gateway campuses, micro campus networks, international branch campuses, and so on. So many potentials there by accepting a practice virtual exchange or coil, and even for virtual mobility. I'll stop here for now. And if you seek more information about us, Kansai University, where I belong. We've been doing that choir practice for the six years now. And IIGE, that's my institution. If you can contact me at this email address, or you can Google up IIGE and our homepage will pop up. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Keiko, for your brief but very to the point uh, presentation. I'm, I'm glad you positioned COIL as a uh, important, for example, for the employability of graduates and as a as a high performing uh, uh, basis for high performing partnerships. And it's not really not a second choice to physical mobility in that respect. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like to bring in now um, Mr. Adrian uh, Veal from the European Commission. Uh, I think he's joining us uh, from from Belgium, where I am as well. Um, he, uh, Adrian, is working at the Director General for Education, Youth, Culture and Sport at the European Commission, uh, where he focuses on uh, Asia. Um, this uh, means also uh, working on the involvement of Asian institutions in the uh, Erasmus Plus uh, program, uh, the international dimension of it. Uh, so um, welcome, Adrian, and uh, please uh, Yes, I will wait for you to appear in our online uh, room. Thank you, uh, Adrian, for uh, taking the time to be with us. Uh, and please, uh, I would invite you to share your views on what has been said and what this can mean for uh, from your point of view. Thank you. Yes, thank thank you very much, uh, Pete, and and thanks also to to all the um, the contributors so far, um, because this is. Um, extremely useful for us as, as the European Commission to hear how um, university uh, teachers and administrators um, across the board are, are tackling this 
this issue. I mean, we have all recognized that um, it has, it was already something which to which we attach great importance, but it's um, this idea of virtual mobility or um, online learning um, as an alternative or um, a substitute for um, uh, classic mobility is, is something that is really exercising us um, at, at present. What I'd like to do is, is just take you through um, a couple of um, areas where I think it will be interesting for uh, the EU and uh, ASEAN countries to, to use the SHARE program to, to exchange ideas, good practice, um, recommendations on um, the way that uh, the higher education sector can, uh, can embrace these um, what are relatively new concepts of, of online mobility. But, but first a little bit about um, how we uh, already uh, work together. Uh, perhaps if we could uh, take the next slide. Um, we have, uh, and, and the next one, we have a program for mobility between uh, the EU and the rest of the world. So we have our classic uh, Erasmus mobility program for students and staff inside Europe. And since 2014, we have a program between Europe and the rest of the world. Um, you'll see ASEAN um, is quite re well represented in, in that program. So we have uh, both mobility in both directions um, to um, all ASEAN countries. It's, it's very limited for, for Brunei and, and Singapore. That's a little bit to do with, with budget, but those um, mobilities are based on partnerships between universities. And they obviously are now uh, looking at how to, or how or if to adapt these classic mobility partnerships um, to include some sort of online learning. Um, the whole of the Erasmus Plus program has been very, very busy over the last three or four months, um, allowing for some flexibility um, to include blended learning as, as part of, of the Erasmus offer. Um, I should say a little bit about Erasmus as a whole. It's been going for over 30 years. And actually, there's a sort of political um, rationale for it, as well as an education rationale. So you have to see Erasmus Plus as part of the EU's own plans for better regional integration, better regional understanding. And I think there's a great parallel with ASEAN here. If, if you work on, if you get the education sector, you get young people um, understanding each other, better linked to each other, then um, you are helping a, a larger process of regional integration. And this is why um, the classic mobility model is actually so important. You you actually go to another country, you experience, uh, get to know the people, the the, the systems, if you like, um, and and this intercultural aspect was was a very important part of of Erasmus. The other part of Erasmus um, cooperation is um, capacity building projects. In the next slide, um, these are more institutional. Um, projects between universities in Europe on the one hand and in ASEAN countries on the other. Um, I've got two examples here because these are, on the next slide, these are looking at um, the way that universities can work together to tackle uh, thematic issues. So you've got a regional project here in, in Southeast Asia looking at digital capacities in higher education. And you have a national project focused more on Vietnam. You can have both types of projects under capacity building, which is looking at um, more online skills among teachers uh, in, uh, in vocational education and training um, in, in Vietnam. So these capacity building projects um, go hand in hand with the mobility projects. They're, they're getting... Um, Europeans and Asians working together to address, you know, common challenges uh, that, that they face in, in both continents. So I think, you know, we can find some, um, some food for thought in what these projects are doing to help um, see the best ways we can adapt our mobility programs. Um, going to the next slide, um, sharing practice. Um, I think there is a lot we can uh, share. There's a lot we can discuss on the way that um, Europe 
um, is now planning to deal with uh, digital in the largest sense, if you like. Um, next slide. It was always um, it was always going to be a major priority. Um, digital skills among society as a whole is part of our current commission's uh, priorities. So we will have um, a digital education action plan. You can see what's being proposed. There is a, uh, at the moment, there's an online consultation for this um, action plan, which is meant to, to build um, skills in, uh, in, in teaching, uh, in systems to make the education uh, systems more digital and to instill um, uh, digital um, competencies uh, among students. So it, it, it's addressing all three aspects of the systems, the learners and, and the teachers to try and um, help create a Europe uh, that is better placed to um, to be competitive, I guess, on, on the international uh, digital stage. Um, but we also have um, a number of other areas. We have Erasmus Virtual Exchange um, that Simona had mentioned. It's uh, a program more to, to get that intercultural understanding going in regions that maybe were not so easy to bring together. Um, this, this was started off with the Southern Mediterranean. So in many countries where the classic uh, mobility, for example, with Syria, with Libya, was not possible to, um, uh, to start up. Uh, so virtual exchange was actually born out of those um, uh, constraints of um, getting people to move. But I think we've seen other reasons why uh, we need to, to look very carefully at um, whether physical mobility is the answer. We, we've had, we, um, you know, this uh, question of sustainability. Um, perhaps digital can make education more inclusive. It's a bit of a double-edged sword that you might make uh, the education more available to a wider body of people, but you might close out some people uh, depending on how well equipped they are to, to follow it. So, um, all this means that in the new program, and this, this is uh, interesting for you to know, we're um, finalizing a new program that will start in 2021. Um, and that will, partly driven by these plans that we already had, but partly driven by the emergence of, of, of the coronavirus crisis, we acknowledge that there is more, we need to focus more on the role of blended learning and, and uh, virtual uh, teaching and virtual mobility um, within uh, the programs. Uh, but we need to know from the universities themselves what they are planning to do. You know, we, we, we can't, we don't make policy in the EU, we share policy, um, and we don't um, impose a practice model on the education institutions. They, they are um, obviously the, the people who decide what is the best way to uh, teach, what is the best way to learn, and what is the best way to adapt uh, the situation um, in, in uh, for example, in, the, in current circumstances. So we are, are listening to the university sector, a lot of consultation going on, and I think it will be useful for, for the SHARE project also to, to share those sorts of um, uh, um, discussions that are going on in, in Europe and Asia um, so that we know how we can best adapt our support for this internationalization, which is, which is at the heart of, of everything that we do. So I have been sort of in, in listening mode. It's been very uh, enlightening uh, for, for me. Um, and maybe uh, I could sort of ask uh, the, it, it might be a good sum up sort of question, um, if I could ask the presenters and, and other participants, you know, how they see um, uh, this focus on virtual mobility going. Is this something that is just, you know, a stopgap measure to deal with a crisis, or, or do you think this is now the opportunity to really embed it in our whole thinking about pedagogy and and um, and the whole education model that we that we have? Yes, uh, please. Um, this question is directed to all the panelists, so I, I could ask you one by one, maybe to give your brief comments. Uh, and reflect on, on, on the question, yes. Uh, Simone, please uh, go ahead. 
Um, definitely, I think, because most lecturers, all academics, have been forced to um, put their classes online now, um, they are now more acquainted with using um, uh, technology. So that really has helped. Um, uh, I think that really will help in um, uh, perhaps uh, including COIL-like courses, assignments within their programs now. So that's really um, um, an advantage for this. Um, to, to think that um, COIL will... Um, uh, we will do COIL instead of going abroad. I, I don't think so. What we need to determine first is what competencies we want our students to acquire. What do we, what do we want them to learn? What, the, what skills do they need to have um, to be effective in the labor market or in the profession? And that's something that we need to determine. And then we can see at what level um, they need to acquire these competencies and whether COIL, um, uh, whether we can use COIL to get to that level. Um, and that also brings in um, the topic of research. So now we are all using COIL and uh, virtual exchange, but we still need to do more research into whether it is effective or not and how it is effective. So because it's quite a new field, there is some research done, but we need to do more into that. Um, so that would be one thing that I really think that, that, that could be a focus is doing more research into COIL and perhaps also um, maybe more training or um, for for academics as well in in using coil within their courses so that would be what i would have said okay thank you simone for sharing your thoughts i will just go in the order i see you on the screen uh, keiko could you please uh, comment from your side sure um what i would think it's an immediate change or probably um dynamics paradigm shift is that um I've seen recently that student mobility um, being very emphasized, particularly in Japan as well. Um, and then the length of mobility getting shorter and shorter. Some research says it's less than eight weeks is the more popular length of student mobility. But with this COVID and then being having the virtual alternative available and also the blended model of mobility, a physical mobility and the virtual mobility and the virtual exchange and coil now available. Um, I predict that uh, mobility, um, the physical mobility will be revisited and considered for whether that's really a worthwhile doing it or not. And if that, that's the case, the length of the mobility is probably going to be a little bit longer. For example, that you go there for a one year or one semester long rather than a two weeks or three weeks short and come back. You think, if you're thinking about risk, health risk, and then everything else, and also the carbon footprint, everything else with the, 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 the shorter mobility sounds like a little bit unnecessary. With the available of other way of learning and immerse yourself in international experience. So I would just say that. Okay, thank you, Keiko. Um, yes, I will pass on to Latif, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Pete. As for us in University Kebangsaan Malaysia, National University of Malaysia, we would like to take this opportunity to just look at the feedback first. It's been an overwhelming semester. Um, people are adapting to new, new ways of doing things and uh, as Simone has also mentioned, it's also provided a very good training ground for the academics to, you know, usually virtual mobility or COIL has been an option. But now we've been put into it, into a situation where we have to adapt to it, especially for this semester. We look forward towards um, getting feedback from our students with regards to the current situation and also feedback from our um, academics and hoping to further enhance that to strengthen things better. Uh, I, I would still like to think um, virtual mobility will not just simply replace physical mobility. I feel that uh, there's an avenue for each of this, you know. There's uh, competencies that, uh, that are different that's available for measurement that we have to look into. I believe uh, blended um, mobility is something we look forward to. Um, UKM is definitely excited to explore on COIL. Uh, we believe, um, hoping for the next few months to be a good training ground for us to find um, 
a partner university and also to train our academics and uh, students to this new concept. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Latif. Uh, and uh, lastly, Kortula, uh, I would like to uh, hear your comments. Thank you. Uh, sorry, you are uh, muted right now. Please unmute. Yes, thank you. No, uh, it's muted again. Sorry. Yeah. So, can you hear? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think uh, our university uh, uh, has switched to the online training um, uh, during the COVID nineteen, and uh, maybe. Um, I think uh, the call uh, is is a, is a very good uh, uh, collaboration online training for our university in the future. But uh, but I think uh, we need uh, to set out uh, the uh, MMS and uh, LCMS system and uh, design online uh, online examination. Uh, uh, organize instruction uh, sections uh, and uh, design materials like lectures uh, lectures must be uh, sufficiently provided to students uh, before lesson and uh, i think we have to prepare uh, so much um, uh, things uh, to uh, uh, do a call in our university yeah okay thank you Thank you, Dr. Tsai. I think, yes, summing up uh, very, very briefly, I think there is opportunity in this crisis. And I think we've heard many great ideas on how we can actually uh, use creativity and online communications to bring uh, international experience to all students uh, at our universities. And that I think would be a great outcome if we can work towards that. But on the other hand, there are many moving parts to this. It's not obvious to do, to do it well. Uh, we need to really build up a methodology, do some research on what are the best methods, how we can achieve this impact that we want. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, but I think there are many people right now very motivated to take this up. So uh, I would thank you all from my side, and I would like to hand over to uh, Darren. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you very much to all of our panelists today. There's clearly so much to discuss here uh, and this conversation will go on. I think we can all agree uh, that be it online or offline in international education, we're all seeking to augment international communication and collaboration. And uh, we hope uh, you who attended on the, the live, chat, live stream, uh, we hope you all enjoy the session. Uh, and I'm sorry we didn't get to the all of the questions, uh, but our panelists have very kindly shared their contact details. So if you'd like to contact them independently, then feel free to, to do that. Uh, we look forward to seeing you, of course, at our next session on Thursday. And I think we can share some information on that now. Yes, so the, the session will be on quality standards for online and distance higher education at the same time on Thursday. So really look forward to, to welcoming you to that and having a further discussion on this very interesting time for higher education and internationalization. Uh, once again, uh, you can uh, provide some feedback uh, at the link we can share. And thank you again for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.